please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance. Our invocation today will be given by Judy Chapman. Will you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, sometimes the world can be an uncertain place. We know that we are in the midst of global change. As Rotarians, we dream of a better world. We have dedicated our efforts to serving others. We ask your blessing today on communities throughout the globe who are in the midst of political turmoil. Protect them and strengthen them as they struggle to produce positive change. Help us to support those changes through our thoughts, words, and actions. Thank you for the meal we have received and all those who have prepared and served it. As always, we thank you for the opportunity to meet in peace and freedom. As we leave today, allow us to be a positive influence in our world. Amen. Thank you, Judy. Would you please join me in the four-way test? Gary Camp will lead us in singing today with Fred Fishburne on a keyboard. Let's pretend that we're a French-Canadian club and sing Viva la Rotarie. Nursing home. And Keith Benner would like to introduce you. My guest today is uh, Matt Beck. Matt is a banker with Bank of Colorado, office about at uh, 2534, uh, where my office is. He's also a member of the uh, Fort Collins Rotary Club, so welcome, Matt. Matt is our first guest with a special announcement. I'm to please introduce our daughter-in-law, Tracy Ashcraft. She's a psychotherapist, has a practice here locally, and she received her master's degree from Bridges University. Awesome. Jeff Swanee with a guest today. My guest today is Bruce Pettigrew. This is probably my last time to introduce him as a guest as he just turned in his application for membership. Yes, sir. Bill McCullough with a special guest. Yes, my guest today is my wife, Valerie, otherwise known as my primary care provider. <laughs> Scoot Childers brought a special guest today, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> My special guest is my special wife, Dottie. You have to stand up. Bill Farley also with a special guest. Well, I guess Scoot's regular wife couldn't come. It's only a special wife. But my wife, Janice, is my guest today. And Cindy Gouldy brought a guest today also. I'm glad at least your wives are sitting with you today. They usually don't. They usually sit over there. <laughs> My special guest today is Brooke Coston. Brooke, would you stand up? She's a returning guest, and I think this is going to be the last time she comes as a guest. Um, Brooke is the uh, executive for Boy Scouts of America for Loveland. So welcome, Brooke. We're glad to have you back. And Mufi Miller brought a guest today. I'm going to introduce Allison Haight. Allison is the new um, Community Development Block, Block Grant Administrator for the City of Loveland. Allison is the place Darcy McClure. And Johan joined us again today, just for the food, I think. But uh, <laughs> Johan, Thank you, Randy. We have a couple birthdays this week. Uh, Bill Hardy was yesterday, and uh, Rhonda Dudley. Rhonda is going, you're going to meet shortly. She's going to do her thumbnail sketch today. Her birthday is on the 17th. Happy birthday. Next, I'm going to ask Lynn Hammond to come up and do a foundation moment. I'm going to try and cover in about two or three minutes uh, the Rotary Foundation and point out some differences between the foundation at Rotary International and the foundation here in the club. You know, as Rotarians, we have five areas of service. We've got club service, community service, uh, vocational service, and international service. And then this last year, they've added youth service. And of course, in club service, you've got like program and community service, the fair that we uh, usher at, uh, teachers awards, uh, these kind of things. And the Loveland Rotary Foundation, as Rich Ball covered a couple of weeks ago, uh, is the 501c3 uh, entity, which means that your contributions to the Loveland Rotary Foundation are tax deductible. And it receives the funds from the duck race and the art show 
and it funds our programs as far as the, the uh, dictionary is concerned, uh, scholarships, and, and other uh, activities that the Board of, of Trustees uh, decide upon. Next, I'd like to invite our new member, Rhonda Dudley, to come up and do her thumbnail. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come up and introduce myself. And um, also, thank you so much for the warm welcome that all of you that I've talked with and met so far have extended to me in the last couple months. I truly appreciate it. It makes me feel, feel good, and I feel very comfortable here with you. Um, so I'm going to try to make this quick and sweet. And if it doesn't go that way, then in four minutes, you may forget about it anyway. So. Um, next, I'm going to ask Larry Carlson followed by Betty Koble in our hobbyist today, and Phil Ashcraft. Um, next, I'd like to invite Dick Bradsby to come up and introduce our Teacher of the Month. Jen, we have a certificate here that reads, the Rotary Club of Loveland is proud to recognize Jen and Uncle for excellence in teaching and outstanding service to the students and community in the Thompson School District. Congratulations, Jana. Next, I'd like to invite Alistair McDonald to come up and introduce our student of the month. Well, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Danielle Craighead, our student of the month. Danielle, it's my honor to present you with this uh, award. Uh, may it be known that Danielle Craighead is awarded this certificate by the Rotary Club of Love of Colorado for devoted and unselfish service above self to school and to the Loveland community. Congratulations. Bill, would you please introduce our guest today, our speaker? Now, it really gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce a good friend, Father Mike Sherman. You know, if somebody talks to Rotary, the one thing they can't be sure of is whether they're going to have half an hour or 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've learned always state your main point first. That way, whenever it's time to quit, you at least heard the main point. And it's simply this. When Colorado public presidents from CSU, from CU Boulder, from wherever else, say that they are hurting for dollars, I speak as a competitor of theirs. Believe them. I served on the mission subcommittee for strategic, the strategic plan for Colorado higher education. We produced our report in November of 2010. The report is easily available online. Just go to the CCHE, Colorado Commission on Higher Ed. It's called the Degree Dividend. This is startling stuff in the sense that we are really in trouble. And when I, who am a competitor, tell you I'm worried for the folks I compete with, I hope you'll take me seriously. From 2000 to 2010, the state of Colorado has been consistently having to cut the money it provided to higher education. It's now labeled the lost decade. And in fact, no more money flows from the state into Colorado higher education now than did in the year 2000 in real dollars. At the same time, the schools have become filled with students, especially the two-year institutions. And the money that the state is supposed to be giving to those institutions per head has in many years not been able to be provided. So you add Community College of Aurora, an extra 500 students, you get the same amount of money as you got last year with the old number of students. Now, the one thing we know coming at 1.30 is that those higher ed institutions, two-year, four-year research universities, are going to get cut again and badly. The legislature has almost no option here. They're trying to fill a $1 billion hole. The um, money from the federal government has been pretty well spent. 
the money that was to carry us through these hard times. And so this coming year, there's very little that the legislature can cut because so many things are protected constitutionally. And our tax structure with Tabor, with Gallagher, uh, with um, the uh, amendment, I forget what the number is now, that partly protected K through 12, really means that the focus has to be on higher ed yet again. The result of this is that the schools have pulled in their belts over and over. And with all due respects to Governor Owens, when he was saying, oh, there's fat in those universities, they can just cut the fat out. I think there was very little fat compared to what he was hoping for. And we've had enough years of cutting the fat out that these institutions are not in a situation where they can find much internally. Um, in that sense, now they're at the point where I think you're going to find the schools running out of classrooms. The next specter in front of us, I fear, is that like Illinois and California, which have been this way for 10 years, the classrooms don't exist to put big enough classes in. And in both of those states, they tell you when you're starting. If you start your bachelor's with us, it will take at least seven years before we offer all the courses you need in order to finish your degree. We at Regis have taken advantage of that, to be frank. We have had for years what we call the Regis Guarantee which is we guarantee you'll be ready to graduate after four years. And that has meant we've picked up a very large number of students from Orange County, California. The tuition is much lower in California, but moms and dads are not dumb. The idea that my kid is going not to be able to be in it for seven years makes it advantageous to say, all right, I'll send you someplace where you can graduate in four, get a good education, and then uh, go out and uh, start earning a living. The hidden danger in all this is that there is very little access in this state for Hispanics. And the Hispanic share of our population has moved up now to roughly 20% of the whole population of the state. What we're doing systematically I'm a political philosopher. In the language of the sociologists, we are creating an underclass because the grade school experience isn't that strong for those youngsters, and then they have no real way to get into college. The net result is what Aristotle shuddered over. You may remember from the old days in Aristotle, the biggest threat <coughs> was when those who had resources were seen through jealous eyes by the poor. And when that happens, you have revolution. What Aristotle argued was this is the reason that stability in any state comes from the middle class. And it has to be a large enough middle class and open to the poor to get into it. That they see hope rather than despair. At the moment, our problem is that those kids from the Hispanic community particularly feel stigmatized, feel deprived, and in the long run, they become less and less happy citizens. <laughs>